discussion of marketing content. Our first panelist for the day holds post-graduation diploma in marketing management and master's degree in veterinary science. He has more than two decades of experience in the domain of technical training, rural development, brand promotion, and various CSR activities. He had worked with the Cabinet Secretariat, Government of India, in 1994, and then joined Double IREC as Assistant Manager. He headed the field business of IREC as its CEO, which is one of the leading animal healthcare organizations. He has worked extensively in the field of animal nutrition. He is an editor of Pashu Swasna Sansar and Livestock Future. He is an executive member of Rural Marketing Association of India, the president of CLFMA Delhi and North Zone. He is on the panel of CRI, SOCAM Committees on Dairy Agriculture Development and Food Security. Ayurved Limited is one of India's leading animal healthcare organization, specializing in providing 360-degree integrated and innovative solutions to the farming community and improving animal health and farm profits. During his career with Ayurved, he has worked closely with farmers to share the concept of Ayurveda and its practical application for improving animal health. He, with the help of the seniors, revived and developed hydroponic system in India. He has popularized the use of Ayurveda in animal health and nutrition. This helped the organization to get the awards from Terry, Gordon Peacock, and Nabar. His current interest involves training and developing the youth, sustainable integration of livestock with agriculture, with the objective of social economic development and inclusive growth. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO and Director of IBET, Mr. Anup Kalra. Mr. Zainas Master, CEO of Shine.com, has more than 20 years of experience working in various roles in the field of marketing strategy and brand management. Being an alumnus of IIM Lucknow, he started his career as a brand manager at Hindustan Unilever and continued to rise to the ranks over the years. He has also been part of organizations like Nokia as a category head and in Ayrton as senior vice president and head devices. His tenure in Shine started way back in 2013 when he joined as a business head. He was responsible for the development and execution of the complete business, brand and product strategy of Shine.com, the second largest job portal of India. It would be a great pleasure to welcome Mr. Cyrus Master onto the panel discussion. It is an immense pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who has been at the forefront of creating technology solutions for diverse fields such as natural language search, spatial and data analytics, consumer segmentation, and economic geography. He has prolific experience at top leadership roles in technology and research based organizations like Enlitis Analytics and Nielsen Company. Enlitis Analytics was established in December 2000 and has since become India's premier economic research and data analytics firm. During his time there, he led many research studies on various aspects of the Indian economy. Research areas include trade, industry, education, public health, and economic geography. Realizing the local language were ignored on the internet, he set up Net Labs, along with a colleague, which led to the initiation and setup of Raftar.in the first universal Hindi search engine as a part of Indicus NetLabs Library. He has also co-authored the book Social and Economic Profile of India as an outcome of working on different social economic studies conducted by Indicus. This is a very complex and wide range of data analysis that has been put forward with remarkable clarity. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to welcome the panel, to the panel, Director of Big, Big Data of Nielsen Company, Mr. Piyush Bajpayee. Mr. Ranjit Oak is the Chief Business Officer, Corporate Travel, MakeMyTrip.com. He is responsible for setting up and leading this new division for the company, which addresses corporate travel needs <coughs> of the customers. Mr. Oak joined Make My Trip in May 2014 as Senior Vice President and Business Leader, Lives. He took on the road leading holidays business in January 2015 and prior to the merger with the IBCO group, he was the chief business officer and head of holidays business unit at Make My Trip. With over 16 years
years of business experience at Procter and Gamble, he last served as Asia Channel leader based out of Singapore. During his tenure, he handled various roles across product categories, geographies, as well as multicultural teams. He has also served as head of market strategy for Gillette Asia. Mr. O holds a mechanical engineering degree from Maharashtra Institute of Technology and an MBA degree in sales and distribution from Indian Institute of Management, Lucknow. A music enthusiast and an active vocalist, he loves to jam with his fellow musicians in Gurdjian regularly. <coughs> Ranjit is also a fitness freak and a mathematics whiz. He is the co-founder of Bhakt Bharat, a non-profit society which helps underprivileged kids in Delhi NCR to hone their athletic skills. We welcome Mr. Ranjit O to join the panelists and raise our conclave. Finally, we would like to welcome the moderator for today's conclave, our very own Professor Anirban Chaudhary. Professor Anirban's breadth of experience covers media, research, financial markets, brand consulting, and post strategic planning with uh, organizations like the Statesman, Ariala Manorama, SHCIL, Shining Strategic Identity, and with J.W. Thompson in Delhi, name of you. He currently teaches at Great Lakes Institute of Management and is also uh, industry sponsored for the consumer research of marketing strategies with leading global market communication and consultancy groups. His current areas of interest include use of play techniques for marketing, strategy development, and leveraging technology for development sector. We request you to join the panel, sir. And with this, we'd like to start the discussion for today. So, uh, good morning, everyone, one more time. And uh, we have a very, very illustrious panel today uh, from multiple you know, sides of the industry. So, the way, uh, with your permission, I'd like to, you know, start this panel discussion in a way where probably uh, each one, one of you will speak for five to seven minutes on the area that you think is going to be driving, you know, the change in business design based on the relevance that you see for the stakeholders that matter. And uh, then we'll you know, proceed as uh, you know, we uh, question, counter question, discuss, right? And then at the end of it, we'll open it to the house to ask some questions, right? So maybe we can start with uh, Mr. Zaris Master. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, this whole piece on uh, design, so uh, when I was going through uh, the previous uh, presentation, I was just tracking my brains in terms of uh, what. So, the whole, whole thing around emerging consumers. So, I think consumers, uh, especially in India, are always emerging and there are various aspects of uh, you know, emerging consumers. So, in mind we heard about rural consumers which are moving up the value chain and we see a large portion of them who are going to come into the consumption basket at this point in time. A second aspect of emerging consumers, something that I deal with uh, on, a, on a more day-to-day -day basis, is this whole thing of uh, young consumers and, and, and in terms of how uh, the Indian economy is again upscaling itself or upscaling itself uh, with the emergence of uh, younger consumers who have far more purchasing power and living in a world which is dramatically different. So, so consumers are emerging and the environment is also emerging. So, uh, in the good old days, uh, I remember not first maybe before you guys were born, but there used to be one TV channel uh, that used to have uh, you know one uh, program and media planning was very simple. It was done on a piece of paper where you said that you wanted to be there on that program or not. It was as simple as that. Uh, today you probably have 150 channels, you don't only just have TV channels, but now there is this whole interaction of uh, what's happening between online and uh, uh, and, and traditional uh, media and how, how we're interacting. So it's no longer just about TV media planning, but it's about how to reach the minds of consumers. So, so the environment is also emerging itself. A third section of emergence that I see happen is move uh, from products to services. So traditionally, economies have been product-led. You know, large companies, my my ex company or a lot of companies here, uh, essentially product companies, right? Uh, but 
increasingly it's going to be services. So over 50% of the GDP is actually going to come from services and therefore what happens in that? Uh, business design for delivery and services is dramatically different uh, from what's happening uh, on the product front. Uh, the next thing uh, that we could talk about is the pace of change. Uh, you know, uh, change was, of course, change is a constant, but uh, change used to have a certain pace in the past, and that has dramatically changed. I, I can tell you that uh, by the time we figure out a change and we try and master it, the next one is always on the corner. So let's look at web, for example. You know, by the time we figured out what the web was, the manner in which the web is getting delivered has changed. We moved from desktops to mobile. Uh, you know, today 80% of the consumption that actually happens happens on mobile, and it does not happen because of affordability. So there was, you know, five years ago there was this whole thing that a computer costs 20,000 rupees, a tablet will cost 7,000 rupees, and so the Indian market will explode with tablets. But what happened? There are no tablets around here. That didn't happen. So the learning out there was that people prefer mobile not because out of affordability, but out of choice. I remember in 2010 I used to work with Nokia. Uh, we were doing consumer visits and we met this 15 year old uh, boy and he was an early adopter of smartphones at that point in time. And he had a laptop and he had a smartphone and we asked him, as you know, he says, I rarely use the laptop right now. So I said, why? Uh, he says, because it takes too long to switch on. And I was like, wow. Right? Uh, but these are these are things. So so that's when my first learning came that people will shift to mobile and all of you. Like I, I think of myself, you know, uh, I moved in at a time uh, into the workforce when laptops had come in. So I first started using a laptop, and I'm very comfortable using a laptop. But most of you are going to enter in when it's about touch typing and things like that. So you will probably not want to use a laptop. Right? So so the way we are now, therefore, uh, you know, we host, we started with with, uh, with mobile compatible. Uh, you know, so how do you handle the low bandwidth on, on, on mobile, so it was, you know, compatible. Then it was user experience in today, it's mobile first. Everything that we are doing, we are actually jumped at it. So my site has 82% of its traffic coming on mobile. We pretty much jumped the web. Uh, you know, a year ago we said, why are we still looking at, uh, you know, what the website looks like? Actually now the website has to be an adaptation of the mobile site. Uh, and, and therefore, the challenges is that. So, I think that's what it is. I think on the other side, uh, there is a lot of clutter that's happening. Uh, the amount of media that's getting bombarded on consumers uh, at this point in time is dramatically high. Uh, and the second part is that, uh, you know, when I, even before the time that I joined, uh, Unilever in India was big primarily because of its advantage on distribution. So, we said that it had an advantage of distribution. In my time, when I was unfortunately an ASM, we realized that that this, you know, that disadvantage was was no longer there. So it was it, uh, and, and then we moved on, etc. So if distribution is not going to be a challenge anymore, if technology is not going to be a challenge anymore, then what's going to be the differentiation? And my point of view actually is brand thing. It's something that we heard in the morning. How do you connect with your consumers? And it remains. Uh, it's not just rural consumers. It's really uh, people like you who have to, you know, connect with the youth. Uh, and the challenge for you guys, I think, uh, uh, you know, you are in, in, in the hot seat at this point in time, it's really comfortable because you are the youth, and so you can just look at yourself and say that this is how it is, but I can bet you, by the time you've done three years of your work experience, uh, the world is going to change. So how do you maintain your connect back, uh, and that's going to be a challenge. In these times of clutter, in these times of lack of differentiation, it's actually brand connect that's all the money. Uh, of course, uh, you know, pricing, etc. makes a difference, but uh, that's the thing that I always say, you know, that's, that's the one difference that I, I think I have. Having worked in a traditional company, I understand the power of Grand Connect, and I think that's what's getting lost these days. I think we're chasing up uh, much faster things, we're trying to uh, go behind. So I always say that, you know, Unilever was a company which was first time right, okay? I spent uh, my last job in Unilever was, I used to spend one year trying to make a 30 second film. That's what my job was. Of course it was made for a large part of the world, uh, it went across Asia, etc. But that was my job. I would spend five hours a day with consumers perfecting my 30 second film. Because that's all I had to communicate with the consumer. And if it succeeded, I would be successful and if it didn't, it did So that's, that's how much emphasis we paid on first time right. The internet world is actually about first to market. 
Right? Uh, I cannot spend another year thinking about it. In a year's time, my company may actually go under if I'm not careful. So, so those are the you know those are the things, those are the ways in which uh, the parameters have changed. Uh, but still, I think it's extremely important to remember the way the competitive edge is still brand connect and building a business around it. Thanks. Thank you. So, so you can start with yours. We'll go each one of you, and then from here. Okay, sure. Uh, so Zaris talked about the consumer side of it. Let me just cover my. Um, my thoughts around the way the market has uh, evolved. And I genuinely believe that the market has come a full circle. So we talk about marketplace. It all started actually with the marketplace, right? So just some thought starters for you, because I know that uh, if I can sow a seed in your mind, somebody in this room is going to disrupt something that's happening within the next year or two years, right? So think about the market, the way it started, you would have seen these black and white pictures of when farmers had a little more than what they needed to consume. And so they would go to the hot markets uh, in the village and start you know, selling their goods. Uh, their only way to sell it was to individually tell people what they're selling. The pricing was flexible, uh, depending on whether their livestock is getting sold or not. At the end of the evening, they might actually drop the price and give it to somebody. They knew the people that they were selling to, and so they could not con them because they had to come back to the same market at the next time round. So if you uh, sold them something of low quality, uh, in that small market, you are going to get penalized for it. Um, and that's how it all started, right? And um, then folks started you know, producing a lot more than they could sell in that market. So then they, it, they started distributing. They put it into a van and they branded that van, and then they would go for, uh, from their own village market to five different village markets and start selling their wares there. It was still, people knew that this guy comes once in a month, uh, he has good stuff, he built out a reputation around the product, around what he was pricing it at, etc. Uh, then, people started making a lot more than they could sell in the five markets, um, and they had to get across a brand message to folks who would buy their stuff without seeing their face. Um, that's where a whole bunch of branding started coming in. Marketing came into picture. Um, uh, very consolidated media, like what Jairus said. There were very limited choices. You had certain national level media that you could put your money into and hope that uh, you know consumers would buy what you're selling. But it was a lot more consolidated, right? Um, then came fragmented media. A whole bunch of media, channels, choices, options, everything came up. Uh, in that clutter, you had to still make some noise and get across. That's where retail started consolidating. So your big ticket retail stores came in. You said, okay, if I get listed in a Walmart, I'm done. I don't have to worry that much about my ATL. As long as I'm on the shelves of a thousand stores in Walmart, my sales target is met. Right. So consolidated retail came into picture. At the end of it, then people started doing online. On online changes changes the story completely because you have an infinite retail store, right? You have Amazon, which can sell anything, any number of this. They don't have a same shelf space that has to be you know divided amongst ten people. You can have ten shelf spaces. I mean, it became completely different. It's an infinite store concept that got built out. Marketing moved from being fragmented to now coming a full circle and coming to being a lot more personal. So folks get surprised. Folks who are not from the generation get very surprised. I had my mom tell me one day that I think I'm being spied on. I said, why, why do you think you're being spied on? She said, you know, I had gone to Amazon and I looked for this particular product. And then I had gone to my daily newspaper and on the side it was the same product. And in the ad, it was the same product and saying, would you like to buy it? So how do they know? I'm sure I'm being spied on, right? So concepts that are relatively newer for folks who are coming from the earlier time, uh, they, surprise, they surprise you completely. We've moved to, again, a place where every product has to be personalized. Every pricing has to be personalized. So if you're buying something, I can assure you, you're not buying at the same discount as the person next to you. Because companies now have to come down to saying, who's the person who's bought? 
Is he going to like my product? What is the background of that person? What is the amount of stock that I have that I want to dynamically price it at? Right down to like what Jairus said, analytics which will uh, decide that if you are searching something on an iPhone, you are a particular segment. I will treat you differently. If you are searching on an Android, a low end Android, I know maybe a little more discount is going to help you. Right? It goes right down to that. It's almost like saying I am back in the heart where I know this person who's come in, he's a zamindar, I know he doesn't, he doesn't matter to him, I'm going to give him better quality and a better pricing, right? Think back again to the time when your, um, and it still happens, right? When, when I go back to my hometown, and I'm sure for some of you to be true, you go back and you see that your parents have this sabzi wala. Apna wala sabzi wala, right? Why? Because you can actually, when you reach there, he knows what you want to buy. Okay, think about analytics. He knows what you want to buy. He knows your background. He knows when you're going to come, how you're going to buy. He knows what customer service is because somebody in your family is going to tell him, yes, food, meat, and milk, so you can tell him what you want to buy. Right? Because as a confidence, you have that it's going to be a 100% full return policy. Right? And he has to treat you with that respect because he knows your lifetime value. Now all of these concepts, think about it and just reapply it to somebody like an Amazon or any other company on board right now who's doing very well, is fundamentally the same. So it's gone right round to understanding the consumer at, at a unit level, understanding each person that you're interacting at a unit level. Earlier on there used to be somebody who used to be a smart businessman doing it at a small scale. Now it's all the jargon that we hear about, AI, ML, everything where you can apply computers to uh, so that you can do it for millions of people but still do it at a unit level. So whatever you're thinking of doing, think about how you're going to be able to scale but you have to scale it at the same time, understand every person at a unit level. Go. So uh, thank you Ranjit. So till now, I think the two panelists have been talking about the changes that have come in. Uh, Zaira's focus on the fragmentation of the media, the emerging uh, you know, new consumer, right? And at the same time, the need for a business delivery that's going to be very different from what we have seen. And Rajiv, you have also been focusing on the duality of uh, scaling up and personalization. So interesting points. Uh, I have a few questions to both of you. And I'll come back to you once we have heard uh, uh, Thanks. Uh, I actually belong to the years when I was a student like you, maybe 25, 30 years ago. But uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. I feel younger. I'm sitting amongst you. Uh, have you heard about uh, agriculture? <laughs> you heard about it? <laughs> Agriculture. It actually talks about culture. Okay, now this agri marketing. Have you heard about livestock? Yes. <laughs> okay. We know about these stocks. Which stocks, which stock is going up? NSC, BSC. In the older days, this used to be the stock. Livestock. If you had to trade anything, you used to trade the cows, the buffaloes, the camels, and the elephants. So the more amount of livestock you had, you were considered to be wealthier, richer. Even when the girl used to get married, you know, the, as part of the dowry, these were given a lot. So that's the livestock. So what I'm trying to tell you friends, is the basics. That's the basic, that's the traditional knowledge. Now what has changed over these 50 years, 100 years, 200 years is that we have brought that culture into market. And what Zyrus uh, and Mr. Polk said, that we are trying to get into the final details of each and every angle of how do I market my product, how do I reach my consumer. How do I analyze it? <coughs> I mean, you know, think of our era. Did we ever think water would be a commodity to be sold? Never ever. It's available. 
in the earlier year, milk was never sold, it was only bartered. Even if you go to the Western UP now, which is very near from here, not very far off, maybe 50 kilometers, people don't sell milk, they barter. They say, ye karna jo hai hamare khilaf hai, mata hum nahi kar sakte. And jisko free mein chahiye, hum de pehenge. Now, as we went along, things are changing and we are getting into the fine materials. For instance, let me give an example, the medical profession. 25-30 years ago, an MBBS doctor used to be sufficient. You know, if you fall ill, you doctor ke paas jana hai. His doctor ke paas jana hai, bola MBBS doctor hona chahiye. Now, his doctor ke paas jana hai, bola saab MD hona chahiye. That's number one tri I mean, criteria, not MBBS. Then further, bola which organ we want to get treated. You want to get treated for liver, kidney. I'll tell you a very uh, important uh, episode which happened with my family. That again is marketing. So my son used to go, uh, he is a gym freak like you. So he used to go to gym regularly and all that. So he had some problem in the tendon. So we were trying to look at who would be the best doctor. So we found one, I will name, in Fortis Hospital, Kutka. What we were told, you know, she is the expert who only tackles the patient with hand healing. Nothing else, nothing on the body. Hands expert. Can you imagine? Now what is this? I mean, you are a doctor, you are an MBBS doctor, you are an MD, MD doctor, you are orthopedic. Now there is super specialization. He is a heart key doctor. So if you have any problem, you will talk to him. This is what is not. Therefore, what you said is very, very relevant and very, very important. So, what is today right, maybe after two years, three years, I mean, this may not hold true. So, all of you have to tighten your shoes. And I think what I have learned over these 20, 25 years is the connect with the customers is the ultimate. That is going to make the difference. Your products are fine. They are competitive in terms of pricing, in terms of delivery. So then if you are able to make a connect, now it could be one-to-one -one connect, it could be the connect through the web, it could be using through uh, AI as you said. Ultimately, customer is going to decide what he's going to buy. Then there may be various ways, whether you, you, know, you, you look at the wife or the children or the person who's going to make the decision. But ultimately, I think it is the customer connect. And second important thing which I would like to share here is that though we are talking about that we are moving towards the modern era, modern marketing, but have you ever thought that we have again actually going back to the traditional roots? What is the need of levers getting into Ayush? And you look any multinational today, it is going back to the roots, the tradition. You know, where we said herbals are excellent, herbals are good for the health. So ultimately, what matters is that, you know, the science behind every product is very, very important. So it's not only the marketing, I was sharing with Professor Kalra while we were coming here. You know, marketing is like a Salman Khan of any film. But then who makes Salman Khan is very important. It is the people behind the movie. That's the people who do the market research, people who put the science behind the product and then make that particular product. And ultimately what you see on the screen is, is marketing or the marketing director. But then there are a lot of efforts which come across, so it's, it's the, what I would say is, it is the integrated effort of all the teams which then get reflected as that it is a marketing giving. So then a lot of people contribute, it could be finance, it could be HR, it could be research and development, and, uh, but ultimately, I, as I look at it, it is the customer connect which makes a lot of difference. Thank you.
your turn and then we come back to all of you. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I think uh, I would start first with trying a very uh, basic uh, insight from what the discussions just happened. Uh, and the fact is that uh, the first principles hold true. Uh, that's, that's what all of them have talked about. The application has been on the consumer side, where is the brand connect happening on the marketplace, personalization is, is important, or the examples uh, Mr. Kaka spoke about. Right? So uh, the fact is that first principles actually uh, are things that drive. And you are in, in these space and you're studying, you're going to get uh, your first principles correct at this stage. Uh, if you get that right, everything are applications on top of it. What has changed a lot, and that's where, uh, you know, uh, working with Nielsen uh, in the past four years has, has taught me, and, and, and I'll borrow examples what they've spoken about, is that the measurement has changed a lot. It's become much finer. And therefore, your applications now has changed much more. So unlike earlier, where you would, you know, let's say, doing a brand connect, it was very difficult to measure that uh, completely. Today, it's much easier. Uh, on the digital space, uh, you know, if, you, if you're looking at any measurement aspect, uh, you, we generally go and take a sample survey. But digital is gone away from sampling. It's census. You have the complete information that's happening. Right? So the paradigm of measurement has completely changed from what was a sample today has moved to getting census information. Therefore, how do you interpret that information is very different. The second has been that uh, from active uh, measurement, which was going and asking people a traditional survey that you would look at, it's become a lot passive. So you're being monitored over your phone. Uh, your actions being present in this place itself would suddenly, you know, let uh, Google know that there are, there are a lot of Android devices in this room, so there's some activity happening, right? How do you interpret that changes a lot. But what's happened is that measurement has become passive. And there are a lot of examples uh, that we look at. Um, uh, for instance, uh, Nielsen has something we call neuroscience, where we actually uh, look at measuring, you know, put, put a cap on your head, and show you a stimulus on advertisement and see uh, what's your reaction. Now, this, this changes because earlier people would ask what your reaction was, so you had a, had a chance to uh, politically change your response. Uh, but today it gets measured even before your conscience, right? So you're even responding, it gets measured, right? So that's, that's passive measurement which has taken over, which is very important because how you now interpret is much more granular that you can go to. So tomorrow, uh, you know, earlier if you would ask any marketing people, you know, if I want to identify which cities to go to, you only had 10 cities because information was only available for 10 cities. Uh, not knowing that there are 7,900 towns in India. How do I choose when between them? The others wouldn't even come in the picture because you didn't have any information to measure. But things have moved a lot. Today we are seeing, and, and I read one example where we actually use satellite imagery to measure income distribution for all of these 7,000 towns. Right? This is something that's now passively measured. There's no biasness to it, and you're able to get that information very quickly. So that's that's the process uh, also uh, which adds into this uh, change in measuring, which is being able to analyze these things very quickly and in real time. So, uh, and both the panelists out here are from the digital space, so they know of the validity of an A and B testing. You know, if you traditionally do an A and B testing, it would take months to do that. And, and believe me, if you're in the rural area, then it would take a whole year to, to even get a sense of what an A and B testing can be done. You know, where do I set up a control and how do I check it? But today that's happening. Even in traditional trade markets, you can actually do real-time A and B testing. Now, those are ways that uh, measurement has changed a lot. While the principle remains the same, it's enabling you now to go back to all the roots that we were talking. Ayush, it was there from a long time. Ayurveda has been there in a long time, but we've never been able to measure its effectiveness. Today, that effectiveness is getting measured in various ways. You know, you've seen biophotons. I don't know if you've heard of that. 
but those are energy applications. They are measuring how effective Ayurvedic can be, or or even things like Reiki. You know, what's the impact of of Reiki being being instead being measured through such uh, procedures that are coming out. So I think that's the bigger piece that I see in in changing environment, uh, which uh, is uh, really important for you to uh, to know of and study. So get your basic principles right. That that's the first part to get, and then these changes will help you, you know, identify the right application. And in the morning we were talking about intuition. That is where you have to apply intuition. How do you use this new methods of measurement to improve what you're doing? I think that that's where I would talk. About. Thank you, Vish. So um, here is my first question. Uh, let me go by the order in which you have spoken for the first round of questions. So. Uh, so I guess, uh, you mentioned something uh, in the context of this fragmented media and the change that you see called brand connect. Right? And for a long time, you know, the brand connect for many brands, whether it's a retail brand or wherever, people could find a way of coming closure, uh, was driven by loyalty. Right? And there's a lot of focus on loyalty and how you build that. Uh, when uh, in current times, there's a huge debate. Uh, in terms of loyalty versus relevance, right? Uh, and and the uh, old rules of loyalty versus being relevant versus being loyal is a big and debated thing. So, what is your view on that? <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a very interesting one. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think that debate has started now. That debate has always remained, uh, you know, this whole piece on uh, brand creation versus brand promotion. Right. So, uh, you know, as marketers, we've always used brand promotion as ways to achieve our objectives in the short run. Uh, so, I'll, I'll come back. I think I think some of the points that I mentioned in terms of clutter, in terms of our options. So, you know, when we were growing up, uh, I call myself as the ration card generation. I'm sure none of you know what a ration card is, right? Uh, but we, we lived in a constrained economy and that's where we grew up, but you guys are growing up in an economy of choice. Uh, and that has an impact on the fundamental way in which we behave and we think. It, it, it's, a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a psychological impact. The way you guys think is dramatically different from generations before you, primarily because of the availability of choice. Uh, now that has an impact. Uh, so, so I would say that uh, today, brand loyalty may seem to be lower because people have choice, all right? In the good old days, there was just one soap, so you used that soap and you used it over a period of time and therefore you became loyal to it and then a new soap came and a new incumbent came and it was that much more difficult for that person to sell. Today, it's not like that. Uh, having said that, I still think and I can show you, I, I can talk about several examples where uh, it is the loyalty which actually becomes even more important in a cluttered environment. All right? Because how long will you promote your brand? How long? What's the financial implication of promoting your brand? What happens to your margins? What happens to your profitability? And therefore, the only way to long-term sustenance is loyalty. How do you earn that loyalty is the key question then. Uh, so, you know, uh, information is a good thing as well as a bad thing. All right? Uh, I think today there is far more information, and that, that's that's what we spoke about. The tools that are available, uh, you know, when we spoke about how the same thing is being done at a mass scale. So it's absolutely right for us to do A/B testing. Uh, Ten to fifteen years ago was an offline task. It was all claim data. It was never action. You know, it was never user data. So uh, when somebody said it's nice, we knew it actually was bad because unless he's like jumping. It's not really nice, right? So, so though we are trying to infer that now we have actual user data which can which can help us, uh, you know, determine some of the things that were done at a small scale. Uh, so, I think also data helps us uh, all become good marketers. Data is good, or data analytics is going to help us all become good marketers. But data is the analysis of it. Fundamentally, and that's my, that's always my point. And a lot of people ask me that will analytics take over the fundamental role of human beings? No, that's not right. Analytics will help us decide what to do, more like decision science or something like that. But the fundamental thinking will still have to be done by us, and that's where the challenge is going to be. You know, 
we will really have to innovate ourselves on what Brand Connect is. We'll have to step that extra mile, understand consumer needs at a very deeper level with tools that are available to us and we're able to do that now. But eventually, Brand Connect has to be. Right. So in that context, uh, you know, uh, China, for example, you know, there is a 25-year-old guy yeah. who has enrolled with a job site. That's right. Right. In yeah. China. Right? Yeah. But uh, there is also competing insights as well. Some right. of them might be existing even before. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what will drive this behavior? Relevancy of what he finds or the loyalty to the brand? Interesting. You know, I can just uh, give an ad about my company. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let, let's take that, that point. So, you know, uh, traditionally we have looked at job sites as, uh, you know, jobs, you know, and therefore the whole race has happened as to who has more candidates, who has more jobs, and therefore I want to go there and things like that. Uh, but then, it, so, so when this market is well established, a new person has to come in. He will have to think through as to what. Is he going to join? So, so you know, red ocean, blue ocean, I don't know if you guys have heard about it. So you, you always have to look at a blue ocean strategy to think what you want to do, and that's the only time it makes sense. So then we said, all right, let's step backwards and say, are people looking for jobs? You know, people are looking for jobs in the short run, but what are people looking for? What are you guys looking for? You came here to build a career for yourself, not the next job. Yes, the next job is important, but you're here to build a career for yourself. If career is what is required, then what do you do? So career has two parts. Opportunity, which is a job, and capability, which is skilling. So that's how we found our niche. Now again, uh, lots of job sites, lots of options, clutter happening. How do you keep engagement going over a longer period of time? So those parameters said that, all right, you get an opportunity, you get a job, but then to perform well, you have to upskill yourself. And therefore, uh, you know, how do you upskill yourself? So that's exactly a very good example on how do you try and build long-term consumer connect even in an environment of high fragmentation and clutter. So in a way, you are identifying new reasons of relevance for them. Which is not just a job, but also new yeah. manifestation. That's what I Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Ranjit, now you are done. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you mentioned something very, very interesting at your uh, you know, opening remarks, uh, which is a word again uh, much discussed today. Uh, you, you painted a picture of a you know, village uh, heart, right? And uh, the very first mention was that this farmer who has something else was there and was selling. And one of the operating uh, you know, verbs there is, and I'm saying verb, is trust, because it's both ways. Now with, with the kind of business that you are, which is digital, right? Today in the digital world, one of the, again, most discussed thing is trust. Uh, trust in terms of Microsoft data, trust in terms of whether I got the right price, and things around, right? So, so how do you see, uh, you know, trust as a, you know, issue being addressed by brands today or, or you know, even digital companies today? So, I think uh, the way most digital companies are heading trust is uh, you have to have a thumbs up from the person that you trust or the mm -hmm. source that you trust. So, yeah, whether I'm talking about Make My Trip, whether you're talking about any of the other companies, they're moving very quickly to um, figuring out how I can get the consumer to uh, know what his trusted set of people are thinking about, user-generated content. How are users talking about what my product is? How are people within your social group talking about it? So now you'll see a lot of folks saying, okay, if I'm uh, taking an example of um, you're coming to my website and write book, book a hotel. Now, I don't even own that supply of the hotel. I don't know if the room is going to be awesome or not. Right. I don't know whether it's under construction right now and hence the swimming pool is closed. It can be something as simple as that. And I sell about 45,000 hotels on my website. How do I make sure that somebody comes to me and trusts me uh, for the place where if anything goes wrong, I'm going to take care of it. Or if something is off, I'm going to tell them in advance. That's where I make sure that my review uh, setup is very strong. And that review setup, I want to make sure is uh, relevant to the consumer who's looking at it. Okay. The moment I have that particular setup going, the moment I have the transparency going, so things like best price guarantee. I now have a best price guarantee for all my hotel room nights on my website. And if you find a better price somewhere else, I'll give you double the difference. Not 
Earlier on, it used to it used to be just um, like in in the offline world, we used to run it and we used to say nobody's going to come back. We used to have a guarantee saying, "Go soak a wrapper, rakna." Mm. If it is something, then you bring back that. Who keeps the soap wrapper, right? Unless you print it and go and fraud somebody. Here, you have all the transactions. You can just click a screenshot of whatever you are looking at and get back to the company and say, "Okay, I trust." So, uh, the trust needs to come from your fundamental product experience, your fundamental transparency, and how does your system become a platform for people to be able to interact between the people that they trust. Just you saying, trust me, or I'm a big brand, or I'm putting a lot of money into Ranveer and Alia on, on TV, and so I must be a trusted company, does not work. So your business experience is what is going to create the trust. For yeah, so product experience and anything that is coming back as feedback from people that you trust. So, so uh, how effectively do you use uh, tools like social listening? So social listening, uh, let me tell you how, uh, how we try and get any kind of an input into the product cycle. And the way we operate on the product cycle is of course we have an integrated uh, system where any kind of a feedback that is coming from a particular customer uh, gets not just picked up by a post sales service queue, which is the usual stuff, right? We want to make sure that you will get what you need if something goes wrong or if you have a feedback to give. But all of that is looped back into the product cycle. That any kind of feedback that we are getting, so we have multiple ways in which we are tapped into a any social media that you think about, and if somebody says, you know, hashtag make my, trip, uh, make my trip sucks, I want to know why, right? And that gets picked up by a separate team which says that anything, any chatter that is happening online regarding our brand, our product experience, our supply experience, we pick that up, we go back again to the fundamentals. I mean, I'll give you an example of the new business that I'm running is corporate travel. We have an escalation, a three-level escalation line now. But at level one escalation, I'm marked on all the emails. Now, I might choose to look at them at a frequency that my time allows me, but I get to hear real-time consumer feedback every single day. That's the only way you're going to be able to stay relevant and understand what's exactly happening. Your business metrics, frankly, can lead you astray because on, in an online world, there are so many variables. You can spike up your business in so many different ways. If you don't go back and understand what the consumer is saying, there's no way that you're going to be able to build that trust. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Kabra, this is for you. Uh -huh. uh, I think you, you brought back the point of, uh, you know, the fundamentals uh, are the same, right? Uh, now, what I am very keen to understand is that you mentioned again, you know, there are differences that you see there, and given that, uh, you know, you operate in the area of livestock health and nutrition okay, as well as agriculture, right, you know. So, uh, how do you see that or that, you know, stakeholder base uh, changing? Uh, for example, if, uh, you know, a livestock requests uh, support from a vet, do they look for a specialized vet, uh, like you mentioned in the urban context? So what, what is the dichotomy, or this for dichotomy is the same? What's your view? Very important question. I think uh, the, the, the very essence of what we've been discussing, the things have been changing. Okay. I'll just quote one example. Have you heard about A2 milk? Yes. I don't know. There's a lot of A2 milk happening all around, uh, at least in metro cities. Earlier, we what we knew was anything white was milk, right? Now you have a cow milk, you have a buffalo milk. Then within cow milk, you have A2 milk and A1 milk. But that is what is the market differentiation which is happening. A2 milk is the milk which is being talked about that if you consume this A2 milk, you will have less <coughs> chances of getting diabetes and other problems. <coughs> And this is produced by other indigenous crops, the, the Indian breeds, Saibar and all that. And this is being worked out scientifically. Now, if you have to have a A2 milk being sold, I know a lot of people in and around Delhi NCR 
are selling that milk 100 rupees a liter. Can you imagine 100 rupees a liter? And it's the integrated business now. You know, it is no more that you know earlier we were wasting the dam of the cow. You know, the dam of the cow. Can you imagine? Sells at 100 rupees a kg. When you convert that into compost, I have seen it with my own eyes. Now, if a person is able to sell the milk for 100 rupees and the compost also for the same price, why would he not want the services of the vet? He would definitely want a specialized service. Or, if it's not specialized, but at least he is very, very keen these days that he gets the right kind of service, right kind of knowledge, right kind of information, which helps in improving his farm profits. So that's, and that I think is very, very key. The customer earlier was that, okay, fine, guy in his own day, yeah, to be okay. If we put the milk in the milk, 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 but now with the changing time, because we said we are in the era of marketing, so it is produce more, sell more, earn more. So whether it is livestock, agriculture, or digital space, we are, you know, in an era where if you have to survive, if you have to excel, if you have to compete, then quality makes all the difference. So one has to focus on the quality. So whether it is milk or it will produce or anything else. And that is the reason farmers are now looking for using the best kind of feeds. You know, which, which we, we did talk that Heroes is there, Godrich is there, we also produce quality feed. So people are looking for quality feeds. And if they produce quality, if they give quality feed to the animals, they would get good produce. Another example, another one which I wish to share with of all the young kids, they may not be aware. At least my children were not there. You know, I asked my kids, my daughters also, and uh, Eco Mother's graduate from the EU. I said, Beta, you know what is going on? I'm talking of the basics. You know, Papa, you know what is going on? Beta, you know what is going on? I don't know, you know what is going on? 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 But actually, Murdika farm, I had to take my son and daughter to the poultry farm and tell them, this is the house from here. I have heard that Bajaj is a good farm, it's a good farm. It's a good farm. I have to take them to that farm, Sanjay Bajaj. I have to take this farm from here and take it from here. Oh no, where did the milk come from? He said, where did the milk come from? Where did the milk come from? It actually comes from the villages. So what I'm saying is, basics are important, but things are changing for good. That's very, very important, relevant, but we cannot afford to lose the basics and look at the top line and the bottom line. Basics have to be corrected, only then top line and bottom line can be looked at. So Piyush, uh, now uh, this question comes uh, from all the discussions that we have been having, and you mentioned something very interesting. You mentioned measurement, uh, you know, has changed in two ways. One is scale, so the same thing of I can now reach out uh, and collect, uh, you know, the measures. The second bit you say is I can move more deeper, which is accuracy, right? That's great. And many of the large operators in, in the marketing field have been using that. But most of the time, you see, desertion comes from you know, uh, parties who probably are not so deep and uh, in terms of measurement, right? So, wh what do you think about, uh, you know, at one end the change that disrupts and the measurement that promises the change? Uh, how are they functioning together? Right. Very interesting question. Uh, so, uh, disruption is uh, getting more driven by uh, Realizing that the change, one, the pace of change is not quick enough. I think that's a whole lot of disruption that's happening. Uh, so why do you need uh, measuring and looking at ways of improving? 
uh, what happens is that the scale and content and whether it's uh, a large organizations like uh, Unilever or even needs and other organizations or the uh, you know the more digital players like even Google and all they also face disruption because when it's the scale becomes large to be able to manage the change and identify uh, you know uh, and, and you know bring that pace in that change is not uh, something that's very uh, uh, easily manageable by large organizations and that's where uh, uh, startups or, or let's say intuition plays and that's the point I was trying to make that intuition actually gives you that scope to uh, identify disruptive opportunities in, in there and then it's happening on a daily basis and I think that's where uh, the whole uh, aspect of being able to also measure and be able to see that now uh, the measurement is also publicly available today so if you have something like data.gov.in I don't know if many students have gone out there if you want to look at data on India it's it's available online it's uh, you know so that's that's measurement that's really available and or people have opportunities to spot uh, areas where they can bring in case the moment they bring in case it's going to change and that's what's happening across the board so, so let me I don't know measurement the volume of it is huge but how relevant is the measurement what's your view on that because for example, all those asset-like business models that we've seen, there have been huge uh, amount of measure available on those services, whether it's photo light or whether it is, uh, you know, city transport. But the disruption came not on the, you know, shoulder of any of these, uh, you know, measures available, but from intuition as you see. So, what is that kind of relevancy and the measurement? Yeah, I, I think uh, Ranjit mentioned uh, and I think even Simon Spencer on uh, the fact that there are a lot of metrics and you can pull today's business in from any any of these directions, you know, you can push things up, you can bring that uh, bump in your uh, uh, sales happening through lots of means and lots of variables playing together. They might uh, not be relevant in bringing that loyalty or the connect Right? And that's where you find the opportunity that comes in. So, so you're planning behind, let's say, if I take a measurement, it's, it's, uh, there, are, uh, there are ways that things uh, can drastically change. Um, uh, I would, you know, uh, uh, look at an example from, uh, we had internet cafes, right? And uh, that internet cafe age would offer a free coffee if you could come for, you know, browsing the net. Today it's just changed completely. You've got um, cafes offering free internet for you to come, right? Now, that's that's a kind of disruption that's changed, right? If you keep running about, you know, that offering free uh, free coffee is the way for me to get internet, cafes would have continued to, to succeed. They did, right? Just changed, and then things changed. But where uh, uh, and that pace is something that's very important and impacts. So yes, relevance is 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 very crucial to it to identifying it. And I think all of us have been collectively stating the fact that you have to be right on your fundamentals. You can't, that doesn't change. Those are, are the things that you need to link what measures is best. But there are ways that you can do. There are applications that are very important. You know, for instance, and I'll, I'll just take an example on the satellite imagery piece. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, take a look at an image of India at night and you'll get areas which are lit. Now that, that's a very good indicator of show, showcasing economic activity. And that's, you know, that's how you can make a relevance to that uh, measurement that's happening. So you have to have that fundamental principle to be able to link things to Okay, thank you, thank you everyone. So I think uh, we had a good discussion till now in terms of uh, different, different approaches to relevance for business growth. Uh, I'll uh, open this panel for questioning. Uh, so you can have your questions, and I'm sure the panel will be very happy to answer, right? So, it's open. Yes. This is, uh, you know, to Ranjit and uh, Zyrus. And I want you guys to go back to your, the days when you were handling physical brands in your PNG and Levers days. You know, what, one of the trends that you're seeing in an emerging market like India is the increasing concentration of organized retail. Now, with organized retail increasing in uh, you know share of the overall retail pie, 
the challenge to the brand manager or the brand owner is the emergence of private labels. In a, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, when I mean, private labels are becoming more and more uh, stronger and bigger, how does a brand stay relevant? So uh, I'll go with what my experience has been on this one is uh, with with the emergence of private labels, what I've realized is that companies have needed to come to terms with the fact that uh, a pure brand um, is going to give you only that much incremental stickiness uh, that, uh, that uh, is now available in the market. Earlier on, a pure brand could give you a lot more stickiness and hence you could make a lot fatter margins out of it, to put it very simply. That particular uh, option no longer exists. Uh, categories as well as differentiators for particular segments is what the companies need to start looking at uh, because uh, commoditized private label brands that are just as good as the product that you're selling, I don't come and eat your breakfast any day. I mean, if you, 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 you'd be really stupid to think that just because you've built out a brand over 200 years, it's not going to happen in the future, right? Because um, I'll give an example of the product that I used to be working on, which is Gillette. Now, Gillette as a as a company has been uh, investing of like a billion dollars in every product that was launched in the market. At the same time, you will have smaller companies that are coming in and are that are at absolutely at an entry level and saying, you know what, if you have a disposable razor, it does the work for a single or two shades that a simple house brand can also do. It then tells me that as a strategy, I cannot afford to depend on that segment or that segment product combination to build out what my business strategy is going to be in the future. Even if that is 40 or 50% of my business today, I need to very quickly think about what my relevance is going to be for segments that are going to be completely different from where the house brand is playing. Purely because I don't have a, a product level differentiator. So either I have to build out a product level differentiator or then I have to look for a different segment that I need to operate in. Or the third option for me is to change my expectations on margin. Those are the three ways that uh, we've looked at it. Yeah, I think, uh, so I have two points to make. Uh, the first one is uh, this whole thing on, and it's a classic example of frenemies in a, in, in a supply chain. Uh, so as a brand marketer, your fundamental objective is to create brand loyalty. And as a store manager, your fundamental objective is to create store loyalty. What does this mean? It means that if your brand is not available in a shop, I want you to walk out of that shop and go to a shop where it's available. That's brand loyalty. A store manager says, that if I don't care about what brand is there, come here, all right? And if A brand is not available, then B brand is available, and therefore this whole piece on store brands, etc. So, so this is actually a case where uh, retail will always be at loggerheads with brands. It's going to happen. And once you understand this, and you also understand that one cannot exist without the other, so you know you learn to work together. That's a case of enemies. The second part, I think I'm going to dwell upon what Ranji said. Uh, I strongly believe that gone are the days when brands could take it easy and sit back and relax. All right? I think you've got to bring something to the party. Yeah. So if you are a large brand, then there must be something, like in the case that he mentioned, you know, there is technology there at the back, which is difficult to replicate at a local level. So you will find, and then let's go back to our fundamentals of segmentation, targeting and positioning, all right? I think again, those fundamental concepts that remain. So he spoke about different segments, and you decide the segment that you're going to operate in, but then you will have to get in something to the party. If you don't get something either through superior understanding of the brand, uh, or of the consumer, or through technology, or through something, if you don't, then you will lose out the margins that again, pretty much. Yeah, I, I, I'd just like to add, uh, Apart from the actual real product experience, I think understanding what need you are satisfying of the customer is probably become even that much more relevant. 
So it's like even if I have a let's say if I have a product which is uh, if I want to do an A/B blind A/B testing, uh, there would be a 50/50 saying, "Hey, I don't even understand which product was which," right? And still there is an affinity towards. I mean, just a show of hands, how many people drink Coke in the room? Coke. All right. How many people Pepsi? All right. So to the question that Zaidis had uh, put forward. If you walk into a pizza hut, right, and you say, "Get me a diet coke," and he says, "Sir, we just serve Pepsi," will you walk out of the pizza hut? No. Yes, no, no. How many people say yes? One person. I love it. Okay, so suddenly, for all the stuff that we've done on the millions of dollars that I've spent on Coke, Pepsi, blah blah blah, what if, and I don't have a choice uh, out of the two, I'm just saying. It becomes very relevant that you have to figure out what is the need. Now, currently, the person at that point of consumption has come to have a good time. He is not come there for either nutritious whatever or for brilliant taste or fizziness or something else, right? Similar example might be in the opposite direction. You know that these two are different brands, but your need is to be cool. And if a particular brand satisfies that need, even if it tastes the same, is made of the same ingredients, is everything else is the same, it satisfies the need that you have that you want to be cool. Then your brand, if you build it out that way, is going to satisfy that need, and it doesn't matter whether you spend more on product or not. So I think understanding what need you are going to satisfy and how well you can do it. The third one, which we talked about earlier on, was trust. So a lot of commoditized products today are available in the market, and people will say this is exactly the same product. It doesn't matter. A classic example was a product that we used to sell in PNG, which is sanitary napkins. Sanitary napkins. When you're talking about how the product is actually made, somebody else might come and say it's very easy for me to make it and replicate exactly the same product, same specifications. But are you going to pick up a house brand of a sanitary pad? Versus something like a whisper where you say, "Hey, this comes from the house of Procter and Gamble. I trust this company. I trust this brand, and hence I'm going to feel a lot safer to use a product that is coming from this house." I think so. There, I'm trying to satisfy the need of trust. Um, so, just to add to the product angle of it, I think just understanding the need and then um, you know fulfilling that need um, can help you also. Tackle the house brand if you're a uh, branded company like. I mean, I'll just That's add it. one. <coughs> the only company that Walmart doesn't take pangas with is B and So I'll just add to what you rightly mentioned, and I really appreciate that. There's a term. It's a technical term. Have you heard about placebo? Yes, yes, yes. Placebo effect. Okay. Now you and me can have a placebo effect. Okay, animals don't have, right? Animals they don't know whether it's a garlic product or a water product. They don't know. Okay, fine. Right. I'll give you an example, and this is a real life. Thing. We have a brand uh, for livestock. Have you heard about Hajmola? Yes. yes. What Hajmola does to you, which I'm like does for the animals. Okay. So that's the brand. Now, when we went to the market. We, we prepared superior packing and you know extract form. Uh, the what was available in the market was 15 grams, 100 grams, uh, one time dose. We came up with 15 grams and special packing so that the ingredients and the quality of the notes are not lost. Not now we priced it at a particular value. And the competition, as is rightly said, was available also at the same price but not delivering the value. When we went to the vet, and to, you know, because in the market you also have paramedics who do a lot of practice, we said, Sir, yeah, this is the benefit. Okay, sir. We tried, he says, How is the result? As you said, customer feedback. This is a lot of And then we thought that now we are going to be the kings because our product works very well, and uh, the vets has accepted, farmers have accepted, and the cows are now healthy and getting more milk. But to our surprise, what we found that the sales are not picking up the way they should have actually picked up. We again went, went back to the market trying to understand 
Now, what was happening is that the practitioner or the farmer, what he was being advised, he says, sir, char puriya aapke liye. Kaunsa wala? As you said, the, the uh, local brand. So, char puriya ye liye liye, sir. Or, ye tower ka do puriya ye liye liye, sir. Sir, ye to dono hi kaisi hai. Well, he said, ye iska to tower wala hai, ye iska ending effect karega. Now, he was making money out of that brand, giving four puriya, and the results were coming from the tower brand. So he was making money and we were losing the market. So then we have to strategize that what do we do now? So competition, as you said, is, is going to be there. We will have to work, rework every day and you know, whatever best we may do, but the competition works much faster than us. So we have to be smart. That's the way I think we have to look at that. Okay, I have one question. Sure. Marketing industries, right? Where well, <coughs> you don't see any royalty. First of all, the what you sell airlines, right? And these are one of the first things to get online, yeah. right? The consumption started, transactions started happening, right? So, I don't think people even now have much of royalty. It is 90% of the population, maybe some businesses they have royalty, yeah. right? And then there won't be royalty at the, uh, the portal level as well. Right, if somebody gives coupons, a whole lot of population would want to use those coupons and go to the other side. Or now you have a third level, the aggregators. They show the prices from multiple coupons. Right? So how do brands in this space differentiate, ensure sneakiness, and repeat uh, purchase behavior? So uh, first of all, absolutely right. Uh, when we had done a study of airline uh, bookings, typically, and I'm sure a whole bunch of you would have also been doing that. If you're not booking on the mobile app, thankfully nowadays a lot of bookings are moving to mobile, so it's not as easy to do all tab. You shift to the next, you know, four tabs open and you're saying up kitna, up kitna, up kitna, and then go out and say that okay, it's 100 rupees cheaper, so I will go and buy. So it's become commoditized. Uh, so I, I don't think we have a choice in India to be higher priced. So we need to work on both the aspects. One is to create product stickiness. And I'll give you some examples of how product stickiness can comes in. Uh, and the second piece is that you have to have your back-end operations so much better than your competition that you can still outprice them. And I mean outprice not just discounting, but outprice them in, uh, in a way which is fundamentally right for the business. So I should have better supply connects. I should have better volume discounts. I should have significantly uh, better uh, method of being able to unearth new supply routes. And that is something that I have to continue to do to be cheaper than anybody else in the market. Apart from that, I should have a good strong cap table so that if there is somebody who comes out with an out of whack discount, I should be able to sustain that for some time till that person doesn't get tired. Right? It doesn't make money, but I make sure that I don't lose market share. From a stickiness point of view, all things given equal, the moment the discounting aspect of pure pricing aspect goes out, and if I am priced exactly the same as my competitor, does the customer come back to me as a realness? And I think for that, from an online business point of view, we slice up the online funnel down to so many different levels to see, uh, it's like what, what Zaris was talking about, that it, you know, one, one year at making a 30 second ad, we actually have, for every level of the funnel, we have a team of engineers whose job is to make sure that they are slicing out milliseconds of, you know, either response time from our website or increasing the conversion rate from one person moving from one uh, step of the funnel to the next by 0.02%. That's the level of, you know, um, the detail that we need to get into. And you don't get to realize it because it's too fine. But when you ask for it, it you say, huh, you, uh, how's your book, booking experience? What do you get to hear? It's very nice. Uh, it's very slick. What do you mean by slick? Right? There are like 400 engineers on my, in my company who are just trying to make the product slick. It's very easy for me to check out. So simple things like, uh, do I save the credit card details? Do you need to fill it out every time that you come and for every booking that you're doing? 
But you have the trust that you can leave your credit card details with me. We don't take any CVVs, we don't store any of that data, just to be clear. But it just makes it so much simpler for you to be able to go through that process. Then you will say, you know, all things given equal, I'm not going to continue with my card. The post is uh, experience. As a company, if you are a, let me sell to you, and now I've made the sale, so forget about it. Right? There are companies, e commerce companies, I'm sure you guys have also had experiences where you buy from one e commerce portal and something goes wrong, you call up, they say, you know what, you have to ship this product to Trivandrum. Then I will think about returning your money, blah, 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 all of these things, right? And then you have experience, and I am a diehard fan of Amazon. Then you have an experience like Amazon. Anything goes wrong, you just say return. They say money comes back to you, no questions asked. Hey, suddenly I'm going to say, oh, my process just became slicker because I'm going to continue buying whatever I want to buy because I have the trust that I can return. Right? So I think building out these small aspects of product stickiness is probably the most critical. And then of course having the wherewithal to be able to discount if somebody comes in to try and discount. Thank you. So I think we had a interesting input from each of the panelists. Uh, I think one voice that has been there is that relevance today has become more relevant because of the you know granularity that is available in terms of measure. But at the same time we cannot uh, move out or forget about the fundamentals of marketing. So thank you all of you and uh, it was wonderful to hear you and I'm sure you will have many more questions but we have limited time so all your questions can be directed and we can ask the panelists to respond to them and that is right. Thank you. Thank you very much.